I'm Naomi, I'm a singer who sews, and I'm here to tell you today about how I made that pinnacle of late medieval conspicuous consumption, the hoopland. A couple of years ago, my dear, sweet, emotional support viking of a husband told me he wanted to be Father Christmas. He described this character as a regal, mystical figure, timeless, grand, but without being over the top. As he told me about his vision for the character, a really strong mental image started to form itself in my mind, and I told him I know exactly what I want to make, and I want to be Mother Christmas. So I drew this on a napkin in an IHOP. He looked at it and he was like, that's it, that's the thing, do it. So we started gathering materials, and last year I made us some 14th century base garments in green silk. So I made myself a kirtle and I made him a cotardie with buttons all down the front and it was beautiful. We also bought the fabric for the hooplons way back then, but I procrastinated for like a really long time on them because I knew exactly what I wanted, but I didn't quite know how to get there yet. But here I am today telling you how I turned just over 20 yards of red cotton velveteen into something right out of a medieval painting. One of the reasons it took me so long to start making the hooplons was my choice of fabric. Since I wanted to build our hooplons out of a cotton velveteen, a fabric with a very obvious nap, I didn't want to make the shortcut version that a lot of people in the SCA use, making the body of the hooplon out of parts of circles. So I asked one of the Facebook groups I'm in for suggestions, and they pointed me towards one of the only extant hooplons in the world. This hoopland, dating to 1396, was part of the funerary costume of John, Duke of Görlitz, son of Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV of Luxembourg. It's made of silk velvet, so it has a nap just like the velveteen. The shape of the garment is comprised of 18 trapezoidal panels, which is an ingenious way to both preserve the direction of the nap and also stabilize any of the seams from stretching out when the garment was hung or worn. If you'd like to know more about this particular garment, you can check out the links in the description below. The link for the Brazen Burgundian is particularly interesting because it contains a PDF of the conservation report from the Museum of the Prague Castle where the hoopland is housed. In order to make a pattern for a similar garment, I relied heavily on that conservation report because it tells me all about the proportions of the original garment. The Prague hoopland is about 150 centimeters in length, with a full hem circumference of about 480 centimeters. This makes the hem measurement about 320% bigger than the length of the garment. The report also tells us that the narrow panels are about 25 centimeters wide, or about 5% of the hem, and the wider panels are about 35 centimeters wide, which is about seven and a half percent. I ended up making a paper model of the original garment, which showed me that the shape of the garment is just about half of a circle. For my costumes, I wanted very opulent hooplons with trains. So I calculated what the length of the back panels might be, which ended up being about 78 inches for my really tall husband. So I used that measurement of 78 inches to calculate the width of the hem and ended up with something that was about six and a half yards. Armed with these measurements, I drew out a cutting diagram which looks like this. You can see that I have two wider rectangles here and here and seven narrow rectangles. One of the narrow rectangles is divided into three triangles which would balance out the center front and center back because I wanted to leave the center front open. If I'd been making a purely historical garment, I probably would have made all the panels right triangles and then just cut into the top portion of the center front triangle if I wanted a keyhole neckline. I did make a separate cutting diagram for my hoopland, but I ended up using the same diagram for my robe as I did with Tyler's, albeit with a shorter length. So with the cutting diagram done, I just dove into making a full-size mock-up. I used a couple of old fitted sheets, so before I could cut out my shapes, I had to remove elastic and tear off some excess fabric. Since my pattern is made of right triangles, I opted to tear appropriately sized rectangles first before marking diagonals and cutting with scissors. 
I laid out the panels to make sure I had everything balanced. Since this was a mock-up, I opted for very long stitches on my sewing machine so it would come together faster. And here it is! First of all, how dare I? Swoosh! Hello, friends. I put this project down for many months. Other things happened. I made other things. I put other things on the internet. I told you about them. I have moved houses, and I'm just now getting back to this because I now have a deadline. And as you can see, I've got my mock-up done. You'll see I've got a lot of creases here. What I'm gonna need to do is take the side pieces off with the shoulder seam, cut a neckline, and actually fit this to my husband because I made this intending to fit it onto my husband. But yeah, uh, I am super happy with how this mock-up looks and I cannot wait to swan around in my hoopla. <laughs> All right, well, I will update you as soon as I have got the mock-up fitting excellently and we will crack on with making the real thing. Okay, so as promised, I came back after I fitted the mock-up to my husband. So let me tell you a little bit about what I did. First of all, I went in on the back triangle panels and cut out a neckline. I also added a bit of slope to the shoulders and cut out some curves for the armholes using a coat hardy pattern I had previously drafted for my husband. At the center front, I decided I wanted a v-neck instead of a collar, so I just took the front triangle panels and eased them into the side panels so that the straight grain edge of the center front connected all the way to the shoulder seam. As for the sleeves, I tried my idea of making them from a rectangle and two right triangles, and it worked out really well, except that the dangles weren't as long as I wanted them to be. The sleeve head was cut bigger than the arm side and eased in with some pleats. So with all of that done on my husband, I figured, since this is not a very fitted garment, that I feel pretty confident with the way that this um, garment is constructed, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in on my hoopland in the cotton velveteen. Let's do it. And here I am getting ready to throw about 10 yards of cotton velveteen in the wash. Once my fabric was washed and tumble dried, I made sure to mark the nap. This arrow points against the direction of the pile. I measured the length of my panels and cut very precisely on the cross grain, pulling threads for accuracy. Then following my cutting diagram, I marked the width of my panels and pulled threads along the straight of grain to make perfect rectangles. You can see here that I used my thumbnail to kind of scooch the fabric along the thread that I was pulling. This actually made a slight mark I used as a cutting guide, but it wasn't until the second hoopline that I realized I could just make that mark even clearer by using my tailor's chalk. So apparently my fabric shrunk in the wash when I washed it. So this panel here would have been an eighth of a yard short, but I was going to have extra anyway, so I'm just going to cut it right here. And here are all my rectangles. On the narrow edge of the wide rectangles, I marked my shoulder width plus seam allowance. The edges of my narrower rectangles got marked about one and three eighths inches. Rather than using a tape measure to mark the diagonals like I did with my mock-up, I simply folded the panels along the diagonal created by the marks I made at either end. In order to make sure my seams didn't stretch, all the right triangles were cut in the same direction except for one narrow panel which was cut with two right triangles centered on an isosceles triangle. To cut my folds, I made sure to keep the fabric taut using my non-dominant hand. I then prepared for a lot of sewing. First, I overlocked the raw edges of all my panels. Nearly two spools later, when this was finally complete, I once again laid out my panels with the isosceles triangle at center back. The bias edge of each panel sits next to the straight edge of the next. Only one of the seams, next to the middle triangle, is bias to bias. It was at this point I realized that the top of each panel isn't symmetrical, so I went ahead and marked the point I'd need to adjust to. 
I cut lengths of twill tape to stabilize each bias to bias seam and got to the arduous process of pinning and sewing. Each seam was sewn at about half an inch, but on my first hoop blonde, I didn't trim off the selvage, which made a few of the seams a little bit more complicated. As I worked, I discovered that this was the ideal pin placement for my velveteen, as I could keep the edges from shifting around by not having to remove pins as I sewed. Once my narrow panels were all attached, I laid a folded towel on my ironing board so I could gently press my seams open without crushing the pile of my velveteen. The center front panels were assembled in a similar manner. Before attaching the wider side panels, I trimmed the tops of the panels to make them symmetrical. I opted to sew the shoulder seams first, and also marked out a general armhole depth before attaching the panels together and stitching the side seams. Now I could do a fitting. I marked the slope of the shoulders as well as the lower edge of the neckline. I eyeballed the shape of the neckline, sewed a new shoulder seam, and then used the creases by my shoulder to estimate the shape and position of the arm side. It's a testament to how far I've come as a sewist that I was able to draw the armholes freehand, though I did have to adjust the shape next to the shoulder seam. I used the shapes I cut out of one armhole as templates to cut the other. Since we're now at the point of cutting sleeves, I'd like to address what I learned about cutting angel sleeves from my mock-up. Each sleeve is created from a rectangle and two triangles. When I first designed my pattern, I had estimated the size of my triangles by measuring the size I thought the wrist opening should be using a tape measure. I made the length of the second leg of my triangles right around 21 inches, hoping that would make sleeves with a point about 6 inches off the ground. When I built the mock-up, the sleeves were not nearly as dramatic as I had hoped, so in order to correctly estimate the length of the sleeves, it turns out you have to use the hypotenuse of the rice triangle, which you can measure from your armpit to the desired length of the sleeve. Once you determine the length of the underarm seam, i.e. the hypotenuse, you can use a squared plus b squared equals c squared to determine the length of the second leg. In my case, the first leg, shoulder to wrist, was about 28 inches, the hypotenuse, the underarm seam, was 42 inches, and that made the second leg of the triangle at the wrist opening about 32 inches. The rectangles for the main body of my sleeve were 26 inches wide at the arm side edge and 28 inches from shoulder to wrist, long enough to fold back for a nice big cuff. I cut two 28 by 32 inch rectangles from which to extract my sleeve danglies. In order for the nap to move in the correct direction, the sleeve triangles must be cut on two different diagonals, which you can see here. To make sure I sewed the sleeve together correctly, I laid out both sleeves with the nap going all the same direction before I sewed. Since the underarm seam is bias to bias, I did reinforce it using twill tape. At the top of the sleeve, I had to clip into the seam allowance in order to connect the underarm seam correctly. My sleeves are lined with white silk dupioni. I laid this out folded lengthwise, but I didn't manage to film how I used the existing sleeve as a pattern to make a two-piece lining. I stitched the lining together before pinning it right sides together to the velveteen sleeve, making sure to align the underarm seams. You can see here how the two-piece lining matches up to the three-piece outer sleeve. Then I stitched all along the wrist edge of the sleeves before clipping the corners at the point and turning the lining out. Once I had pressed the edges, I laid the sleeve out so I could align the underarm seam and tack it down nearly invisibly 
You'll see here that in order to make the most of the silk I had without having to piece it, the lining is actually about an inch shorter than the velveteen sleeve. I used a herringbone stitch to catch the lining, but if you cut the lining the same size as the sleeve, you could just sew both layers into the arm side. After the sleeve was assembled, I pinned it into the arm side, easing in the excess fabric with a few knife pleats at the shoulder, hand basted it in, and then stitched by machine. Right about this point, I constructed most of the emotional support Vikings hoopla and in the same manner, using up spool 3 and starting into spool 4. All in all, I ended up using nearly 2 kilometers of red thread. With so much fabric, a hoopla would be hard to manage without a waist stay. I measured the length of the stay in grosgrain ribbon before having Tyler put on the robe inside out. Then I pinned the ends of the ribbon to the center front edge before pinning the side seams in the correct position, and arranging the panel seams into even pleats. These I stitched down with heavy duty thread, like so. Turns out that I didn't leave quite enough ease in the length of Tyler's ribbon stay, so I did have to add a few inches after the fact. For the hem, I pinned one half while Tyler was wearing it, and then folded up the other half to match before trimming. On my hoop, I just eyeballed the hem shape, though I wish I had been patient enough to have my friend pin it for me, because the side is slightly too long and ends up folding underneath itself when I walk. The hem of each robe is about seven yards long. I tore a length of poly cotton lengthwise as a hem facing and stitched it to the right side of the velveteen, then folded it up and pressed the edge. But rather than shaping the facing with seams or cutting it into pieces, I just pinned its top edge into loose pleats. I did end up securing the pleats nearest the center front opening using a large running stitch, but otherwise, I just catch stitched the facing down along the top. I found it easiest to maintain the appropriate tension on the fabric by laying it out on the floor. As I mentioned way back when I was discussing the mock-up, my husband's hoopland was made to have a v-neck in front. I wanted mine to more closely represent the images that we have in historical manuscripts, so my construction diverged slightly. If you remember, I had cut myself a front and a back neckline. This is because I wanted a big ol' fur collar. The first step to drafting a great collar was to measure the neck hole. Using these measurements and a tutorial from dresspatternmaking.com, link below, I drafted a 3 inch wide, one piece collar with about a 1.5 inch integrated collar stand. I had a scrap of velveteen, but it was too small to make the under collar one piece and keep the nap running the correct direction, so I cut a two piece under collar. I cut the interlining from one piece of sew-in interfacing, marked my roll line and seam allowances, then basted the interlining to the under collar along the roll line and set to pad stitching. I was going to treat this sew-in interfacing like a hair canvas, but it is not flexible enough to do that, so I'm about to rip this all out. At this point, I ended up using a piece of polyester twill from my stash to interline the collar. But next time, I hope I get to try real hair canvas. After pad stitching the interlining to the under collar, I cut the outer fur collar. I experimented with several shapes of pad stitching, but ended up with the shape you see here. I had to pull out a lot of the fur that was trapped in the seam, but it looked really nice once I'd trimmed the seam allowance, clipped the corners, and turned the collar. I steamed it into shape on my tailor's hand before attaching it to my hoopland. I wanted a really nice finish to my center front edges, so I pinned another length of grosgrain ribbon along the opening. To go around the neck curve of Tyler's hoopland, I just pleated the ribbon down rather than cutting a separate facing, which might have been slightly less bulky. Regardless, on both robes, I folded in the end of the ribbon and secured it with a whip stitch. 
before using a herringbone stitch to secure the length of the ribbon. At the waist stay, I wanted a little bit more stability, so I use a whip stitch there. And now for the final touches. You can't have Father Christmas without white fur. I opted to buy faux fur yardage since I could get more than enough trim out of four yards of fabric, whereas buying pre-made fur trim would have taken at least 20 yards and cost almost the same price per yard. Because the selvage was very wavy and had some matted in glue, I trimmed it off. I learned that faux fur is really fun to work with because the fabric backing is often machine knit. Once I measured the width of my trim, it was really easy to cut straight lines because of the nature of the fabric. And my scissors did really well, making a super satisfying glide along the knit ridges. I know gliding along the fabric dulls scissors more quickly. Don't at me. It saved time and it was really fun. To ensure correct trim placement, I marked just inside the width of the trim before pinning it and stitching it down with a long running stitch. At the points of the sleeves, I had to do a bit of trimming so I could get the correct shape. On the Viking soup wand, I trimmed the center front edges with about one and a half inches of fur and about four and a half inches of trim along the hem. The last step was the closures. I had bought new hooks and eyes for both robes, but I couldn't find the second box when I needed it, so for Tyler's robe, I used these antique closures. I put a pair of hooks and eyes at the waist stay, and then alternated hooks and eyes every three or so inches above and below that point. Tyler's robe was left open below the closures, but I ended up sewing the bottom few feet of my hoopla closed so I could avoid kicking it open and showing off the contrasting hem facing. You can see here how I opted for slightly different trim placement on mine and Tyler's hoopla. I put a lot of my trim on the inside as a nod to historical hoopla, which, if we can believe the images, were often completely lined with fur. Tyler's trim is on the outside to imitate the modern vision of Santa Claus more closely, and he has heavier trim to complement his larger size. Now, if you'd like to see just how majestic these hooplons are on living, breathing bodies, you'll have to tune into my channel for my next video, which will hopefully be posted on the last Monday of December. See you next time! <laughs>